Hello, good afternoon everyone. Thank you so much for coming to the UCL first webinar of uh, 2024 of the UCL Warning Research Centre. Um, and we are really delighted to have Beth Edbert here today talking about value chain approaches to improve early warning systems. So welcome to those who are here in person who have um, some refreshments and thank you for joining us to those online or watching again. So Dr. Beth Edbert is a senior principal research scientist and forecast quality team leader. Um, and she has a very long standing interest in forecast verification and evaluation. More recently, she now leads the WMO WWRP project on value chain approaches to evaluate end to end early warning chains that bring natural and social scientists together to help improve weather warnings. Beth also has an interest in working across weather and health as well, and was one of the people that helped develop one of the first early warning systems for thunderstorm asthma, which I find fascinating. Um, so Beth, we're so glad to have Beth here. She is a um, she is an affiliate of the Warning Research Centre, and um, she will be talking to us about some really exciting uh, results from the project. And Beth, I'll hand it over to you, and we will then take questions following uh, Beth's talk, and then we'll have a panel with a few experts who I will introduce following. Okay, thank you, Beth. Thank you, Karina, and um, thanks everybody for coming out and people online. It's wonderful to be here. Um, I think the fact that there's a warning research center is an amazing accomplishment, and I think there's so much great work that goes on here. When I look at the website and I look at the research that's going on, and it's just really great to, to come and have a chance to talk to you at all. So I will, I will be talking about um, value chain approaches. Um, and in the context of a project that we're working on through the WMO, World Meteorological Organization, but also in, in broader. Um, so I'd like to um, acknowledge my co-authors here too, David Hoffman, uh, Carla Mooney, both of my colleagues at the Bureau of Meteorology in Australia, and Brian Golding, who's in, in the audience. Oops. Let's see. Um, there we go. OK. Um, so what I'll be talking about today, I'll cover three things, sort of an introduction to the weather information value chain. I think this won't be an, um, a foreign concept to most of you. I think you've probably got a fair idea of what this is, but we'll talk about that a little bit. Um, then I'll tell you some of the progress with our project with the WMO, the World Weather Research Program. And then I'll give a couple of examples of how we are using in Australia um, value chain methods to look at our services or think about planning new um, weather and warning services. So just thinking about a value chain, um, the concept first gained popularity in um, economic fields and the idea of, of adding value to um, raw materials as it goes through a processing in a factory and um, then advertising and, and all of that out the end. And the idea is that you take something that's got less value and each step adds value to it as, as you go through. Oops, sorry. Um, yeah, okay. Yeah, let's use that, okay. Um, so an information value chain is a little bit different from a manufacturing value chain, but it's a similar idea that value is added as you go through a set of processes or information creation and enhancement. Um, and the idea is to result in improved outcomes. Um, and an important thing about a value chain as opposed to say an economic analysis is that you're looking at the means of getting to the benefit. So what happens as you move through rather than just what is the final outcome at the end? They're both important, but the value chain is looking at the processes. And so in the context of um, weather or hydrometeorology, um, one of the very earliest um, visualizations of a value chain was from Jeff Lazo at NCAR. Just looking at the conversion, if you have weather information, you make use observations to make a forecast, you communicate the forecast, somebody makes some decisions based on it, and hopefully they have a benefit as a result of um, what is hopefully a good forecast. And this is very simple and, and value chains are never this simple. Um, one of the things that I wanted to just touch on before I show you some value chains is to 
talk through what 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 does value chain mean? And this really threw me for a while until I realized, well, a value chain can be lots of things. Um, most of the time when I use it, I'm using it as a way of thinking. So we're thinking about processes, generation of new information, maybe loss of information. Um, but it also can be a way of organizing information. So you can you can make a picture and say, well, this happens here, and then this happens there, and then that happens there. And when you do that, and particularly with a group, people can see where they fit into things. And it's kind of nice in that way. So um, I, it can also be a concrete realization. So in the example of um, a warning service, it might be the flood warning system in Australia. And the Bureau of Meteorology produces the rain forecasts, and then the hydrologists take that and put it into flood forecasts, and so on through, through the chain um, until you know, people take some action on it. It can also be a measurement approach. Um, and so this is the more sort of economic view of things where you try and say, well, the information has got this much value here, but then when this additional context or additional data um, is added, then its value increases. Or if some of the data is lost in translation or mis misinterpreted, it might have lost some value. And you can use measurements to, um, to do that. So a value chain can really be all of these things. So when I talk about in the next several minutes about value chains, it can be one of, you know, it will be one of these, but it, it won't always be the same. So I hope you don't find it too confusing. Um, okay, this is a diagram that's about 10 years old and it was um, developed in Germany and adapted and used quite a lot in Australia for national weather services. And so this is what our value chain looks like to most of us in a weather service. Um, we make observations, we put those into models and we make predictions of the weather. There's a whole lot of data processing and there may be some statistical corrections and post-processing that we do. Our operational forecasters will look at that information, they'll add their intelligence to it, um, and then they'll make a forecast and a warning and they'll convey that to people. And it just magically goes to customers and customers do something. Um, that's too simple, as we all know. Um, there's a number of, of steps, and even, even this is a simplification, but lots of other people involved. So um, the media is part of disseminating the message. Um, different people need to interpret it and receive it um, and make decisions and so on. And so one of the really important learnings of a value chain, at least in my field, is that partnerships are critical, that nobody can do everything that needs to be done. Um, particularly for uh, extreme weather, we need to get measurements from other places besides our own. We embed forecasters in other agencies to help them with their interpretation and combining it with their own um, measurements and models and, and concepts. Um, we have fire behavior analysts in Australia. This is a very important job. Um, bushfire is a, a common hazard. And so there's a special profession called fire behavior analyst, FBEN, um, and we work closely with them. Um, a lot of joint planning, of course, um, and joint communication, joint media, um, and expert advice to government. And so everyone is really not working in a vacuum. They're working with their partners to make this all work. So I'm now going to just show a couple of representations of value chains. I'll go through these fairly quickly. And hopefully some of them will be kind of familiar. Um, this is not a line like I showed you before, but um, this early warning system diagram, this is well known. And it really includes the kinds of um, capabilities, the kinds of time scales, the kinds of context that all have to come together um, to make warnings work. Um, here's another one that is um, more recent. And it, this is talking about integration of information systems. So you need to collect data from all different kinds and integrate that information. And it, maybe there's a slight technical focus in a value chain like this, but you see that it's a circle um, with people in the center. This is another one from the WISER program, um, which is a UK um, development program. And this has got a lot of the actors and players, but not necessarily in any particular order. And so an emphasis on something like this is, is that everyone is involved, but they might be doing many things. 
And here's another example. So a causal loop um, where you have feedbacks. And so some information comes out here, goes over there, gets changed, and it might come back around looking a little different. And so um, networks is another way of looking at a value chain. And in fact, a real warning situation, you've got interactions going on all over the place on different time scales. And, and a network is probably closer to what it truly is, um, but it's very complicated to render it. And so we, we typically fall back to um, simple diagrams like this. Um, this is the one that we use in the WWRP project. Um, Brian, this is Brian's um, famous mountains and valleys of death. So in this, in this um, schematic of the value chain, each of the mountains is a different capability. It might be um, the people who make the observations or the people who do the weather modeling or, and, and so on. So the different communities of people working within their centers of expertise and bridges represent information flowing between the different people that are, that are working on um, the weather information. Um, and weather goes, or the information goes both ways. Um, during a, an actual warning event, it tends to go quickly from left to right because you've got um, operating processes that need to work in a certain way. But information does go back the other way as well as people on the ground tell the people upstream what's going on and so on. And then the planning and the post-event review is a slower process. And that often goes from, well, what happened? Why did it happen that way? Well, let's look at what happened upstream from that or what needs to happen upstream from that. So it's, it's, this is a cycle, even though it looks like a line. And um, I guess uh, using this some more, um, we think about gains and losses of information and how we might measure that. So if I were to start with the top, the, the green um, arrows, observations add certainty. Certainty is um, very valuable. The forecasting gives you that lead time. The hazard forecasting usually gets down to a little bit more local accuracy and, and is now talking about not just it's going to be cold, but it's going to be slippery in this place. Um, the impact predictions or impact um, discussions make it relevant to what you need to watch out for. Um, the communication provides engagement, really important. If people aren't engaged, the warning's not really going to have an effect. And then, of course, the decisions um, hopefully are beneficial decisions. But there's a whole lot of other things that don't work so well, and value can be lost. For example, if um, observational data isn't fully utilized or it's not shared, it's losing the value that it inherently has or some of it. Um, our weather forecasts are, have fixed our limited resolution. And so particularly if we um, say in a weather center, we might be making very precise forecasts. They might not be perfectly accurate, but they might be quite precise, but that typically doesn't get transmitted to the next people down the chain. We lose some information there. Um, hazard outputs are typically used qualitatively. Um, lack of precision, um, communication can be not effective in many ways. Um, and then, at the end, even if everything else worked perfectly, somebody may not be able to act on a warning due to their vulnerabilities or um, you know, limitations that they may have. Um, and then of course, uncertainty. There's All of this is accompanied by uncertainty in the information as well, which propagates through. So I'm now gonna to swap to talking about our WMO project. Um, don't worry too much about on the left. This is a bit of organizational information where this all fits into the World Meteorological Organization. But the World Weather Research Program is where weather research um, happens. And this, this is sitting within that within the High Impact Weather Project and also the Socioeconomic Research Applications Working Group. Um, our project has been going since the end of 2020, and it will finish this year. And we have a wonderful project team and community of about 40 physical and social scientists, about evenly split, and we meet bi-monthly. And we just, just had our meeting last night. So what's this project about? Well, it's got um, two main aims. One, the first is to explore the idea of a value chain as an analysis approach to understand and improve um, warnings 
existing warnings and to understand how information is created and flows through um, the different parts of the warning chain. And then we also would like to get an evidence base for this. So we will reviewing uh, warning chains that exist for high impact events that have occurred somewhere in the globe um, in recent years, collecting that information to ideally put it into a database so that you can use it as a research resource for understanding what has and hasn't worked well. So the outputs of the project will be um, a framework. So some friendly guidance for people who are interested in using value chain thinking to apply to their problem. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, we have already a questionnaire, um, a fairly detailed questionnaire for collecting information about events that have occurred. And it prompts with, with quite a lot of um, questions about what happened, who is involved, why might this have worked well or not worked well, and so on. And then ultimately we'd like to put it into a, an, an ongoing database um, to be hosted here at UCL. We're very excited about that. Um, that will be a, um, then a resource for researchers to use. So starting with the questionnaire, um, we've just got a DOI for it a couple of weeks ago. Um, so you can go, if you, if you want to see what's in the questionnaire, you can take a picture on your camera and that'll go to the High Weather website, or you can go to the, the um, link there and follow it. But what you'll see when you get there is um, a, the questionnaire itself, there's also a guide and there's a rapid assessment version. But in the questionnaire, um, there's three parts. So the first part is a table of essential information about the event, where it occurred, when it occurred, um, what, what were the major impacts of the event, um, what was the response to the event. So it's the, the sort of information that tends to get collected in other databases, such as EMDAT or Disinventar, um, a little more weather in it than those ones have, but um, very brief um, summary type information. Then the second part, the supplementary information, is where the real riches are. And there's for each of these um, dot points, there's a page that's got a number of questions that probe for what happened, what, what existed before, what were some of the nuances, um, and you know, depending on the topic. Um, and so you, you can get an idea of what's there. And it's not just what happened, but the last dot point is asking people to look across the whole chain as a whole and say, well, how did, how well did the information flow? Did people get what they needed? What was the weakest link in all of this? What was the strongest link in all of this? What were the lessons that were learned from previous events and were they applied again here? So trying to take that um, broad look across all of the elements in together. And then we also have at the end, a subjective assessment um, where people can rate each part of the chain on a scale of one to five. It's um, not meant to be used very quantitatively. It's more of an indicator for people who are looking at cases to say, well, I'm interested in a case where the weather forecasts were terrible. And they can go and say, well, these cases, people scored the weather forecast is pretty low. So it, that's really how that's meant to be used. Um, we also have a PowerPoint version of it recently that was um, produced by some of our colleagues at the Met Office. And this is a, a quick and dirty way to capture information when an event is going on and um, you're grabbing stuff off, off the web or through the emails or wherever it might be coming from and just stuffing it in here. Um, and this, this might be all you ever do, but ideally it's a dumping ground until you can do a more detailed um, analysis but at least it, it's a way to capture things before they disappear. Um, and then if you do wanna give a talk about it, conveniently, it's already in a slideshow. So it's kind of nice for that. So if you're interested in doing a case study, um, we would be very pleased for you to use either of these tools. Um, but I would say this the PowerPoint is probably a, a nice, easy place to start. So I was gonna show you a Zoom video, um, but we couldn't get the sound to work very well for everybody. So I won't actually play the video, but if you go to the high weather website, that was the um, QR code that we showed earlier, you can, you can have a look at this. It's a five minute tips on doing case studies. And we've got about, oh, I don't know, eight or nine people from around the world telling you what they did and what was their challenge and, and what's their tip for making things work. So 
it's a nice video. The other thing that we are doing a lot with our template is using it as an educational tool in the classroom or um, with interns. And I've got a photo here of Audrey, who was one of our um, master student interns this year, um, who was working on case studies for course credit. And in both, uh, we have a colleague at uh, University of Miami who uses it as an undergraduate project and take, divides up the, the questionnaire into the part with the weather, the part with the hazards, the part with the impacts, and, and small groups, student groups work on each of those and, and search out the information, report on it, and then work it up as a case study, and then, and then give a talk on it as well. And it's been really, really successful. Um, the students, whether they're interested in weather, they find out about what does it all mean? It, you know, what, what are the impacts of the weather and how do people respond to it? And if they're more on, interested in the warning and response, they can find out a little bit more about, well, where does all this information come from? How is it produced? How does it get here? So it's been good that way. Um, and it's, it's usually a, um, a fun thing to do as well. Um, and we um, do actually use their projects. We put them in our database because they're with some vetting, of course, but um, they're really quite good. So I'm very happy to do that. And I, and I hope that that might be something that um, UCL and other universities could think about doing. Um, and we can, um, I think there's some scope for some more research that could be done with students. So um, working with weather services, for example, it's a good way for students to maybe get some industry experience. And that's what we've been doing in the Bureau in Australia. So how many cases have we got? It's not huge. Um, 39 cases have been started. About half that, a little less than half that number have actually been completed. But um, you know, if we look, the green stars are the ones that are done. The red ones are um, ones that aren't done. And I think there's some red ones that didn't make it onto the map. But you can see that we've got um, quite a few in North America. Um, our colleague in Miami is looking at hurricane cases, so no surprises there. But um, we don't have any in South America yet. If anybody's looking at South America, please come and do a case. Um, and we don't have very much in Africa either. But Europe's um, pretty well covered. It, Australia, New Zealand, Pacific, we've got quite a few cases there as well. So I just want to show you um, an example, just a very brief example of the kinds of stuff that people are, are putting into these case studies. So this is, this is Hurricane Ida. This is done by our um, university colleague at Miami, his student group. Um, so they start with the weather. Um, it's a tropical cyclone that made landfall in Florida. Um, they use a lot of um, resources from the National Weather Service and, and its offices. Um, this was an interesting case because, um, let's see, is this working? Yeah, maybe not. Anyway, um, the hurricane came in um, in Louisiana, and then it turned into an extra tropical storm and went up through New York City. And it was interesting because the biggest impacts weren't in Louisiana, they were in New York. Um, so flash flood, wind, tornado, storm surge, storm surge is a, a huge killer. Um, but it was it was the heavy rain that turned out to be the worst the worst hazard on that. 82 deaths for an American storm. That's a lot. That's really a lot. Um, a lot of other um, impacts that displacement um, damages and so on. Um, the warnings were pretty good um, for the hurricane, but what was failing was the warnings for the heavy rain that went up through the nor northeastern part of the country, and so. Um, the people in Louisiana are used to having hurricanes. They are better about knowing what to do. Um, wasn't perfect, but um, it was was kind of okay. But in New York, they weren't used to worrying about hurricanes, um, even though, um, and I think that they may not have even been using the name Ida by the time it got to New York, or it would have been, um, you know, former former storm Ida or something. And because it wasn't being called hurricane, people didn't necessarily think they had to worry. And so there were a lot of um, drownings in um, underground in basement apartments. So this is the, the kind of um, look across an event that we're trying to get. Um, obviously there's more information than just this, this brief summary here, but this is the kind of thing. 
some of the early findings um, from comparing lots of events, Brian did a very nice study um, a little over a year ago, looking at, a, I think it was 10 extreme events, is that right? Um, and the ones that are being looked at have been very quite, very extreme, such as the, um, the European floods in July, 2021, where a lot of people say afterwards, yeah, I heard the warning, but I didn't expect it was gonna be like that. So unprecedented. Um, so different, different factors led to the warnings not being fully effective. Um, obviously predicting the weather is an imperfect science. Um, poor understanding of vulnerability, people's own understanding of their own vulnerability, but also um, with the responders as well, just generally not understood as well as it would need to be. Um, underestimation of the impact and a lot of follow-on risks. So um, disruption of water supplies and um, disruption of um, the, the supply chain for food or electricity and things like that. So um, even if you were safe from the, the, the damaging winds or the flooding rains, you might be cold or hungry. Um, the warnings weren't always timely enough. Um, they could be poorly communicated. Often they weren't well understood clearly. Um, and um, because these were extreme, the pre-event response planning was often not up to the task as well. Um, now, one of, one of the caveats of doing studies like this is we are basing it a lot on information that comes through the media or through reports. It's in, incomplete. We weren't there. We didn't, ex well, mostly Jeff was there. <laughs> and so, um, yeah, it's, you always have to watch out for bias in, in the information and in the studies and in, your, in yourself as well. Um, and we haven't been doing a lot with um, run of the mill warnings or one of run of the mill events. We've been looking at extremes and really we probably should be doing more with day-to-day -day warnings. Some of the challenges for doing case studies, there's a lot of those. Um, the data is highly variable. Um, if you work in a weather center like I do, um, I can get a hold of that, but there's lots of other stuff I can't get a hold of. But if you wanted to do a case study and you didn't work in a weather center, well, you would probably have to go and ask somebody or if, if the storm was in America, you might be able to find it, but you know, it's, it's, it's difficult to find. Um, hazard observations and forecasts are hard, even harder to get a hold of, I think. Um, impacts seem to be pretty well reported, um, but again, you hear about the big stuff, not so much the little stuff. Um, and the connections between the forecasts and the warnings aren't always archived too, even you would think they would be in a weather center, but um, they might be done by different groups and um, yeah, it's hard to know how what people did. You can do surveys, but they're not always done. We would love to see more surveys to know how people did actually respond. Um, and often the media sensationalizes things. So what you get from the media may not may be a biased um, a view. And taking um, doing a case study, if you do it right away, you. Get, you can get what you get right away, but often there's a lot of analysis that gets done over the next couple, several years. Um, you know, whether it's um, reviews that the government asks for or academic studies. And so you're never really done with one of these things. So you, you, you get pretty far, but then you should always be keeping in the back of your mind, well, I'll keep my eye out to see if something else has come along for Hurricane Ida or any of these other cases. Um, Collecting perishable information can be difficult. So that was one of the things that was driving that, um, that fast template um, is to try and grab it while it was there. Um, and then the, the, the gnarly problem of the value of the warning if, is if somebody takes the action to protect themselves and then you don't have so much impact. So then how do you evaluate the warning? So um, you have to take sort of an epidemiological, you know, population view, but for a, an individual event, can you say this warning certainly saved 200 lives? It, it's, it's very hard to say. So uh, moving on to the database, um, one of the things that we did earlier today was to talk about um, the database that um, our interns developed. And I think I've got a picture coming up on that, but just trying to, to say, we're not trying to replicate what already exists. 
we're trying to add or complement um, what's out there with, with some of these other databases that I'm sure many of you are very familiar with. Um, and so rather than looking at thousands or millions of cases, uh, we're taking a deep dive and looking at a smaller number, but really trying to go into depth and probe. Um, so. So here's an example of um, what we had a, a couple of interns who came to the Bureau of Meteorology, two data science students um, for course credit, took some of the cases that were done and built a prototype database using something called Retool. It's an app builder. Um, and we were really pleased. It, this was um, something that we'd been wanting to try, but none of us um, who are leading the project had the right sort of expertise. But getting a couple of interns turned out to be a really smart thing to do. And they did a very nice job of um, prototyping um, a simple interface to um, show the events, show the essential information, and then link to the PDF where you can find more. So what we'll be doing um, over the coming year will be to have a look at how this can be improved upon, how we can build more cases into the database, how we can make it more useful um, so that um, before too much longer, we'll be able to release it as a research tool that people can interrogate, but also add cases to. Um, so yeah, very excited about the collaboration that's coming up. So I want to just um, finish off the talk, um, talking about how we're applying value chain approaches to um, weather services and warning services. Um, so some of the ways that you could use value chain thinking. So first off, um, understanding an existing service chain. Who's involved? Where do they work? What do they do? What information flows? And just using it as a way to get an overall picture of, of how the whole thing hangs together. And this, this can be done really nicely in a group um, where people can see without... Um, you don't have to invest a lot of money in this. It's a, it's, a, it's a fun activity and informative so that people really see where they fit. Um, we can use it to examine why the service isn't effective or isn't as effective as it should be, or maybe wasn't as effective as it could have been for a particular event. And the, the case studies um, that I was showing before is one way that you can interrogate for an event, but you might also um, use um, sort of... Um, logic models and, and other things to try and understand why things aren't working as, as you'd like them to. Um, you can assess the value of the service. Um, so this is more of an economic type approach um, before you make a change and after you make a change. So you can, you can see if I um, make my weather model more accurate, well, how does that flow through? If I make my um, communications more effective, how does that flow through? Um, and so that's the value chain is a very good way for, for doing that. And then if you've done that, that helps you to allocate your resources. So if you want a new supercomputer, well, that'll be a hundred million. But if you want to improve your communications, well, it's going to be less than that. So where do you, where do you invest? Um, and then of course, co-designing a new service um, from the ground up. So you might not have something that exists, or you might have similar things elsewhere, but you're now starting with a new group of people, a new set of policies and players and parameters and mandates. Um, and with the Early Warnings for All initiative, um, certainly there's a lot of attention on this and a lot of really great resources on how to do this, starting with the end in mind. What are the, what are the decisions people, need? well, what are they vulnerable to, but what are then the decisions they would need to make to, to do something and working backwards? So a little bit about the framework that we're working on. Um, we're hoping to create a friendly guide for people who are pract you know, practicing. Um, they could be weather services, they could be emergency people, they could be government, they could be researchers even, um, on how to use value chain methodologies to do the sorts of things that I was talking about on the last slide. So you can see our table of contents that sort of reflects the, the value chain uses that I was talking about a minute ago. Um, this is our writing team. So Jeff's in the photo there. Um, <laughs> and we, we were fortunate to be able to go on a writing retreat um, in Switzerland, which was 
very, very useful. And um, we're hoping to release this in 2024. We still got a ways to go, hoping to have it done by now, but it's turning out to be fairly challenging to gather up a lot of information and put it in, in friendly terms. But we will have, um, as part of the framework, some tools that you can use for um, workshop activities or um, diagnosing things and so on. And then we'll also have um, a fairly extensive list of case studies where people have used value chain approaches in hydrometeorology or in hazard space. Whether they called them that or not, they're actually using it and, and examining um, how a, how warnings went for a particular event, or they might be talking about why a warning system wasn't working and how they improved it, you know, things like that. So I'll talk about two examples of ways that we've used it in Australia. So the first was to really take a close look at what happened during a flood event that happened in 2021, so a few years ago. Um, and we wanted to do two things. We wanted to understand what happened, sort of a timeline sort of sense, who did what when, but then how can we get better? And it wasn't the typical thing, which is um, a part of the organization looking at their part of it. We invited people from right across the Bureau of Meteorology. We did want to invite our hazard partners in the external world. We were unable to do that um, for, I won't, I won't go into the reasons. So we had to sort of channel what we knew about what they would say or what we thought they would say. Um, but we, we went through a, a two day workshop, but before that we, um, we did um, interviews, we um, put the value chain template, the questionnaire together. And this was our real first use of that questionnaire that I talked about earlier. So it was a bit trying it out to see if it was fit for purpose. We got a whole lot of stuff from the archive and post event reports. Um, a lot of information on um, impacts from other sources, um, interviews, as I said, and that, that interviewing was an interesting process for me because I'm a physical scientist and not a forecaster. And what I learned from that process was that some of the forecasters that we talked to were still traumatized by this event. A few people had died in it and they felt that if only they didn't done it a little better or a little different, that wouldn't have happened. And that was that was a very humbling experience. So um, that was it was interesting. And now, if I, if I were to do this again, I would approach it in a gentler way than than we did. Um, so some of the workshop activities um, we created a timeline. So underneath all those colored sticky notes, there's a timeline of of what parts of the value chain happened when. So one week before, during the week before, during the event, and so on. And so we asked people to say, well, what was painful about that? What was really good about that? What are some opportunities to get better that we know about? And then what are some updates that we know are, are happening? Let's get those onto the chart. And by having a broad spectrum of people across the Bureau, um, I think everyone got some greater visibility of what was going on elsewhere in the organization that they didn't know about. For example, the people who, um, maintain the flood network, the, the um, river gauges and the telemetry so that all the data can get from where the, the measurements being made out in the field into head office. They had all kinds of um, things that they needed to do. I had no idea about that. This is so interesting. Um, and everybody said, oh, I really, you know, I didn't know that's what you did. So that was, that was a good thing to do. We had another activity where we asked people who are let's say adjacent in the chain to, to talk with their um, information providers or information receivers and saying, well, what do you give me? What do I need? What do I give you? What do you need? And, and spotted some differences there. So that was pretty useful. And then we, we surveyed people as well. And so um, we came up with quite a lot of learnings. I'm not gonna read these. I'm happy to share the talk if anybody wants to see what we learned, but even using the value chain to frame, well, here's where the learnings sit in the whole scope of the things that we do and being able to come up with some recommendations for um, what we could take forward to make those warnings better. So another workshop that we ran um, 
last year, no, two years, well, almost two years ago, was when we had a fire conference, fire behavior conference, and we had a workshop with partners in the fire space, but also in the warning and communication and public um, engagement space, looking ahead 40 years and saying, well, the or sorry, 20 years, as the climate warms, how do we need to adapt our services so that they're going to be fit for purpose? What do we need to start working on now so that when we get those terrible temperatures and, and dangerous fire weather, that we can better cope with it? And so we use the value chain as a way to frame that as well. And because it would be a sort of a new service or maybe some transformational change, we started with the end in mind, this case. And so we started with, well, what does the community going to need? Well. They're gonna be more older people. Um, they're gonna be more urban probably than they are now. Um, there's gonna be a whole lot of other things that we don't know about, but, but those things we can be pretty confident of. Um, it's gonna be hotter, you know, that from the climate projections with these temperatures were over 48. It's not unheard of, but you know, you don't have big swaths of it, it's horrible. Um, and so we got, had all these people together in, in the room working on this in, as in a group, working from the community needs back up the chain. And so um, what, we, what we did was to try and get um, groups together with similar perspectives, but different from each other. So table work. Um, and they were to um, come up with some of the challenges and opportunities. So we have community members, the people who do the, um, the warning and public information. So they're more on the um, response side, let's say. And then the more scientific, you know, modeling information generation, fire behavior analysts and the meteorologists. And so we had um, each of them identify a bunch of products and services, new capabilities, culture change, systems, data, and so on. And you can imagine that those two divisions of the, of the groups had quite different perspectives. So the, the scientists were saying, well, we need bigger computers and more data. And um, you know, the, the people in the community and the engagement side, well, we, we need people to be risk aware and educated. And, and so we ranked everything by popularity. And here's what the top four priorities were. There were something like 27 priorities all up. But it was a mixture of things. So improved fire situation and prediction information. This was coming out that if you don't have at least good knowledge of the, the fire and what it's going to do, the rest of it is of lesser value. I'd say it's not, yeah. But then number two is um, education. So we really need people to be aware of their risk and what do they do. Um, more networked data. So again, there's a, um, a bit of a technical element in there, but also the sharing, the, the co-production and so on. Um, and then planning and pre preparation. So when you think about the all of the elements for an early warning system, there's a lot of those cover that space really pretty well. Um, and, and how did it help us to use a value chain to do that? Um, it actually, by focusing on a 20 year hypothetical event, got people out of their normal mode of thinking a little bit, not entirely, but um, they, they could think, well, I might be able to do something in 20 years that I can't do now. Let me, let me just imagine that I can do that. Um, and it enabled reflection of how far we, can, we have already come, you know, and especially for someone like me that's been around for a long time, it's pretty amazing what I think what we can do now. And if that rate of change continues in 20 years, we're gonna be doing amazing things. Um, really focused on the user perspectives a lot more. You know, we, we run into the risk, at least where I work, of thinking we've got technical solutions and scientific solutions for everything, but that's only really part of the story. Um, shifted the mindsets with multiple perspectives, diverse conversations. It was, was really an interesting day. Um, and you could try to stress test some of the ideas because there were people in the room who you don't normally talk to. So that was a good chance to do that. Um, recognize the linkages highlighted the need for knowledge sharing and collaboration. 
So just coming down the home stretch, um, there's a couple of recent papers on the um, on the project. One about citizen science and where citizens can contribute um, and take part in the warning value chain. Um, another paper that's about the um, using value chain approaches led by David Hoffman, and then a paper from Brian on um, comparing the the ten events and what what was learned from that and some of the lessons. Just some final remarks. Um, the project finishes this year. Um, we hope the framework will be completed and out by September, um, hopefully before that, but that's sort of really when we want to have it. Um, the database will be further developed through our collaboration here at UCL and um, hoping to have something out by later this year. Um, and the methods and the learnings from this project will inform other projects of the World Weather Research Program and WMO as well. So WMO projects have historically tended to be very uh, focused on natural science modeling and so on. And the value of social science is being increasingly recognized and brought in. And this is a, this project is a good example of that. So that future projects will should also have always have an element of that. Uh, we're finding that this concept of a value chain is very useful for framing early warning services. Um, the case studies are supporting analysis and research, um, or they will when, when they're released a little bit more publicly. Um, the workshops and the activities can be used by anybody to understand the warning value chain and how you might improve the services that are involved. And I wanted to also highlight some great work that is going on by the REAP community, the Risk Informed Early Action Partnership. I don't know whether some of you might be involved in that, but um, two documents that are coming out just about now. The first one is a compendium of value chain visualization. So many of those value chain pictures I showed you earlier in the talk are found in that document and they describe what are the, the pros and cons of each way of looking at the the warning value chain in that way and, and early action. Um, and then there's another paper on the role of, of actors in early warning, early action. And so looking at who's involved, what groups, what people, and um, making recommendations about that. So I'll just um, finish here and say thank you again for inviting me. Um, it's been Great having had a chance to visit and tell you about the project. Here's a few, if you're if you're interested, some more things that you can read to find out more. Yeah, thank you. couple of questions actually I was writing them while you were talking but maybe I should uh, I'll ask two uh, what uh, would be the possible applications for the database that you have been building on uh, what sort of applications would you anticipate from this information that is being collected and in the questionnaire were there some reflections or questions related to climate change and extremes for example do people perceive those extreme events that they have documented as an outcome of climate change or something which connects those events to the to the changing climate? Thank you. Okay, yeah, thanks. Good questions both. Um, in terms of applications of the database, I can think of a few. Um, one is to cross compare um, across, um, say for the same type of hazard maybe, like flood is as an example. How do different countries do it? What's working well in one place or not, and, and could be applied elsewhere? Um, I think it gives some examples of how things work as well. So we're, we'd really like to get some um, more case studies from countries that are developing or maybe less developed, let's say, than, than the UK or Australia, where other people could look and say, well, I can see how they've organized their thing we could maybe do some of that as well. So having it as a resource where people can see opportunities for things that they may want to do in their own place. So the, the compare and contrast, um, finding examples. Um, 
yeah, there's, there's many other things, but when, um, I suppose these case studies, they're kind of a, a light touch, even though it's not very light, but a light touch on what happened. And so they can be a launching place for deeper study. So if you were interested in how did people respond to this event, you could start with one of these case studies to get the overall picture and then follow down a particular line of research. And so that would be another thing that you could do. Um, in terms of the climate question, we didn't specifically put in a question about climate change, but we do have a, con a question about climate context. And a lot of we're finding that many people are answering it in a climate change sort of way. So the, the way that we had intended the question was, um, how did this event sort of, how extreme was it in terms of its usual climatology of that place? You know, is it a one in a hundred year event? Is it a five times a year event? Um, but a lot of people are saying, and with the climate changing, this is becoming more frequent. So, um, and, and that's fine. We welcome, welcome answers like that. There's also in many parts of the questionnaire, um, kind of a wild card question, additional analysis and successes and, and issues. So some, you know, people who have more things that they'd like to say that weren't necessarily addressed by the questions that were listed can add whatever they like in those spots. And, and um, you know, Brian has, has done that quite a bit. So. so. Other question? Yeah, I'd like to ask, are you keeping any record of failed prediction? So, um, that is one question. And another thing, say for next uh, June, July, August, what would be the prediction for ENSO? What phase it would be? Different model is giving different indication. Are you keeping a record which one to accept? And one model is at giving a successful in predicting for one case, but next the next year that model is not giving good result. And the other way also, some model yeah. is giving one result, other model, model is giving other result. How you can differentiate that in your models? Um, some of that we're doing. So we, we are trying to collect the, um, the context for the weather situation. So if it's a La Nina or an El Nino or positive or negative IOD or any, any of the drivers of climate that we know um, affect what, what may happen or the strength of what may happen, um, we do try and get that information. But we're not specifically saying, well, you know, let's say the, the UK coupled model, it worked well this time, but it didn't work well last time. We're not, we're not really going for that information, but it could potentially be drawn out if it happened to be there, but we're not, we're not searching. Brian, did you want to? Yeah, because I think one of the things that we would like to capture is um, where the issue of the warning was perhaps delayed because the different models were disagreeing. Um, that, that sort of thing. So the way in which those disagreements affected the operation of the warning chain. Um, and, and indeed, if they didn't, if the forecasters already knew that a particular model was good for this sort of situation, if they went to that model and ig ignored the others, ag again, that's sort of the sort of thing that it's really good to capture. Yeah. So, so what, um, Brian's really getting at the, at the decision process and, and how people use the information that's available. Um, I wouldn't want to say anything about next year's <laughs> climate situation. But, yeah. OK, we have some questions online. OK, Mariana Bodimir, hello, thank you. So we have. Um, Great presentation. How do you take into consideration the diversity of users' needs? Do you disaggregate by gender, age, etc., to understand who is receiving and un understanding warnings? We would love to be able to do that. Um, I don't think our questions have specifically asked for that information, but if people wanted to um, follow that line, um, of questioning, they would be welcome to do that. But I guess it would be difficult from what we've got in the questionnaire right at the moment. We, we do ask a little bit about who was affected and why. What did they understand about things? Um, but we're probably not going so far into the data, the demographic data. Um, yeah. Thank you. So we've got another three questions here. 
So from Kate Jones, what tools tend to be used to examine why early warning services haven't been effective? And who is making the judgment call about relative effectiveness in the case studies that have been looked at so far? For those online, there's a few giggles going on. Yeah. <laughs> because it's a very good question. <laughs> it, is, it is a good question. So um, the person who's doing the case study is using their judgment. So we have to be very mindful that that person may not be an expert, they may have their biases and so on. So it's really, um, when you use these data, you need to be using it as, a, as an indicator, but not as a 100% you know, accurate reflection of, of everything. Um, because there are just a lot of uncertainties. So it is, it is actually the, um, whoever's doing the study, but hopefully if they're doing it a reasonable job, they will be reading um, reports and and information that um, supports their viewpoint, let's say. But uh, you know, I'll, I'll I'll give an anecdote. So um, this year, my interns did a comparative flood case. So they did a 2022 flood in Australia, and then they did a 2022 flood in South Africa. And just due to what they know about Australia and their personal experience. And what they didn't know about South Africa and, and didn't have personal experience, they made a certain judgment about things which I, with my more experience, think, mm, not sure I agree with that. So it was very clear to me that um, they had formed an opinion, but based on limited information. So that's, that's always going to be the case. Um, so. One of the dangers of using qualitative data, yeah. I suppose, but yeah. we won't go down that route. Um, so a question here from Reef Secretariat, Lorraine Yules. Thank you very much for joining us. Oh, hi, Lorraine. <laughs> um, and uh, as we said before, there's the REAP reports. Please do take a look at those. So the question is, is there work to do around understanding how and why the value chain differs in developed versus developing countries, i.e. capacity issues along the value chain, the use and focus of early actions, the potential impact of hazards and the differing hazards. I think information on the kinds of differences could be really useful for countries and donors in developing value chains to better serve societies. That's, that's a brilliant suggestion, actually, to, um, to look at the differences between different countries and regions in their capacity to, for, for any parts along the value chain and, and using that. So that would definitely be a research application of this data. And indeed, I would suggest that it might be something that AI technology might be able to assist us in, in, in helping with the, the more qualitative aspects of the, the data entry. So it might be able to help us with that. So the final question is from Caroline Zastrell. Hopefully, I've present, um, pronounced that correctly. Uh, and from the review and analysis of value chains case studies, do you have some top recommendations for the communication of warnings to the public and to the responder agencies? Oh, goodness. Um, <laughs> Um, I think there's a lot of excellent recommendations that exist. Um, I would say that the recommendations probably aren't necessarily what we have already drawn out of the out of the database. That work is yet to be done, but um, but we know that um, that clear communication, that consistent um, consistent information, um, trust. There's there's a lot of of um, important factors. I'm not an expert in this, so I should probably stop here. And I'm, I'm sure that there are people in this room who could answer that question very well. Um, but yeah, there's, there's wonderful advice out there. And I think, again, with the Early Warnings for All, that information, and Warning Research Center as well, that information is becoming more and more available to people who are interested. So we we'll just encourage people to um, look at the guidelines that are out there. Brilliant, thank you. I shall move, we shall move on to the a little panel uh, session that we'll have now, and then obviously if there's any last questions, we can we can do that. So if I could invite Brian and Ting Sun to, to take a seat, um, then that would be great. Do you want to Let's take a seat there? Okay. And uh, I will hover at the end here. Excellent, so just a, a little introduction here. So, um, Brian Golding, Professor Brian Golding. Shall I call you Sir? 
professor. No. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Definitely not. Is a fellow in weather impacts at the Met Office and visiting professor at Bristol University and co-chair of the World Meteorological Organization's 10-year high, high impact weather project. Um, he is, uh, well, he's been um, from 2005 to 2012, direct, Deputy Director of Weather Service at Met Office. And following his retirement from this role, he was awarded the OBE to Services for Weather Forecasting and the Prediction of Hazardous Weather. So welcome, Brian. And Brian is also the author of Towards, or the, ed the key editor and instigator of Provide uh, Towards the, the Perfect Weather Warning book that you can see on the screen there. And then also welcome Dr. Ting Sung, who is a lecturer in climate and meteorological hazard risks at the UCL Institute of Risk and Disaster Reduction. He's a climate scholar with expertise spanning hydrology, meteorology and the built environment. And his research looks at the impacts of weather and climate extremes such as heat waves and extreme rainfall in urban settings. So thank you very much for joining us. Ting. Oh, do you want me to turn mine off? Oh, okay, yeah. Is, is this, is this better? Can pass that one? Yeah, if you just pass that one along, then I hope you can't turn it off, I don't think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, brilliant. Um, so, um, thank you and welcome. Thank you so much for coming. I have a few questions here, which I've got. Um, here so i guess i just wanted to, to 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 kick off and obviously you know if this becomes more of a discussion it'd be great to you know um pitch in so it's it's, it's uh, important that we all um pitch in and then hopefully have a good discussion about everything um so i guess what i wanted to ask is firstly how impactful do you think the warning value chain concept is and what have been the limitations of it don't have to answer, you don't all have to answer the same question, but <laughs> so it's I think it's been surprisingly impactful. Um, the, the the five values of death seems to have caught uh, an imagination gap. Um, I'm not sure <laughs> I, I think a lot of people will say it's oversimplified and and therefore it's not necessarily helpful, but it's certainly caught on and I think the fact that it's caught on means that people are thinking that way who wouldn't have done so I think that's been really good the flip side is that um, the whole issue of uh, disaster risk reduction is much bigger than warning the warning chain and uh, the many people have a preference for a, for a much larger uh, warning cycle, which involves the preparation of people, um, uh, base under underlying knowledge, things that happen over over long time, uh, perhaps over decades even, within which then the, the the sort of the fast operating warning system is much is just a part, and um, I think some people think that, that that by focusing on the warning chain itself, we're we're taking the um, emphasis away from those longer term issues so i i i think overall it's been beneficial but um you you could argue <laughs> want to come in on that one uh, thanks brian uh, probably just want to chip in with my uh perspective as an educator here since uh, uh in, in addition to my research i'm also lecturing uh, on a course called uh, uh, climate and uh, natural hazard risks. So for that one, I think uh, in addition to the hazards or the physical basis, which uh, I'm uh, more comfortable with, we might also want to introduce such a value chain concept in that for our students to better understand the context and impact around those climate related hazards. I think that um, one of the impacts I've observed of using a value chain way of looking at um, warnings, certainly in my organization, is awareness raising of all of the partners and all of the other, all of the myriad of things that need to work together in order to make the thing work. Um, we all can very easily get um, 
so involved in our particular core expertise and, and we might know the people just immediately around us, but we don't know, we don't have that vision of the bigger picture and who's involved, um, especially outside of our own organizations, but even within our own organizations. So I, I think as an awareness raising, um, that's been very helpful and important. Thank you. And, you know, the High Weather Project, um, well, it's now in its 10th year, 10th and final year, um, it's been an extraordinary project um, and, and spanned many different countries. But I guess I just wanted to ask, what impact do you think the project has had, both within the World Meteorological Organization in terms of potentially changing its practices or approaches based on the findings? I know we're sort of getting to that, that point in the project, but also what kind of learnings or impact do you think the results are having on initiatives such as the Warning for All um, initiative, for example? Well, I'll, I'll comment on the WMO perspective as, as it seems to me. Um, as I said in my talk, WMO projects used to be mainly focused on improving um, capabilities, the science projects, let's say, knowledge, understanding, um, modeling capability, use of data, and so on. And what High Weather has been pretty unique in doing amongst the WWRP projects is bringing in the importance of communication, the importance of understanding decision making, of the risk. Um, and so it's, it's part of a, a worldwide increasing appreciation, amongst meteorologists at least, of the importance of getting those parts of the value chain right in order to get the benefit. But I think um, future projects in the WWRP should all have elements of um, benefit, um, user take up communication, um, risk understanding, um, user application, so yeah. Yeah, I think to add to that, one of the things that um, it, it's resulted in is a much closer relationship between the uh, services arm of the WMO and the research arm. Uh, in fact, the, the connection between high weather and the, um, the, the sort of the, the early warning parts of the services side is, is now really close and almost bypasses the hierarchy. Um, and, and I mean, clearly we need to move beyond that, but that, that's a really good start. As far as early warnings for all is concerned, I was really pleased to see the, the bridges on the front page of the initial early warnings for all. So that the, the concept, the, the sort of the, the underlying concept of the need for partnership and for good communication between the, the different areas, we certainly got that through. I mean, of course it's still got to be delivered, but it's, you know, I felt that was, that, that was a real, uh, a real, pin in the board for for high weather and, and, and for the value chain concept. So I was going to ask, um, so far the database has been related on, uh, on weather related hazards. Uh, and just sort of thinking more broadly, how do you think the database would work for different types of hazards, say like geological, tsunami related, and, and or space weather even, or even human made? Um, and I guess I ask that in the context of, you know, we're living in a world now where we very rarely have like a single hazard event happening in isolation. And often the disaster comes from a multiple hazard situation, hybrid of human, generated and natural generated um, events. And I just wondered if you thought that the database could be useful and how that might be done in terms of trying to capture those kinds of situations um, and what challenges might be involved in doing that. Sorry, just a small question then. <laughs> <laughs> so I believe that the database should be well suited for geological hazards that can be warned for. So volcanic eruptions, tsunami, um, Maybe, maybe oh, space weather, perhaps. Um, what it's not so good at yet, I would say, is compound hazards. So we do ask a few questions about were there pre-existing conditions that could have made this worse? But there's a lot more thinking and a lot more probing that could and should be done to 
try and reflect multi-hazards and compounding hazards. Um, and so that's one of the things that I'm hoping this collaboration project will be able to do is to say, well, it's rare that one thing happens in isolation, so what can we do to better reflect that? I fully agree with that. Thinking of the um, value chain concept in, it, in a more abstract sense, though, I think it, it applies really well. And in the, the um, final chapter of the book, I actually use um, uh, fire warning systems, you know, the normal warning system in, in any building for, for a fire al alarm as, as an example and contrast the way, uh, the way the response process and plan for a fire alarm maps against the, the sort of things, sort of considerations we have for, for um, our weather related arm. And, and there is certainly, you, you can sort of do it. Um, and I think doing that sort of thing really helps to um, it makes you look look at your weather related warning in a completely different way, um, and and that's always good. Here, I just uh, want to appreciate the approach taken in building this uh, database through so the end to end approach. I learned that actually very lately, and uh, I thought it's a very excellent idea to embed this approach in building such a database to make that a, a unique asset to all human beings. Climate change is such a hot topic these days. And uh, for many so-called natural disasters, we know some people in this room strongly disagree. And uh, indeed, so for all these, these disasters, they are kind of the outcome of a series of uh, uh, choices, so disaster by choice. So by building such a database, we can more clearly see in which step we are going wrong. As long uh, so when we are building up such a database, so when we are collecting more lines of evidence of that, so better lessons could be learned. I think that's the value of it. So indeed, that's very much the hope. Okay, so one last question for me, and then I'll open it up to everyone else if they have a question. Um, but I guess, you know, if we look back at the, so let's look back at the Sendai framework. Um, in 2015, there's been a much more emphasis in the, the, the impact and integration of health into disasters. And I know, Ting and Beth, you've looked um, significantly at health aspects relating to heat and asthma and, and so on. Um, and I just think, you know, what, where is the, where is our future in this? Because I still feel like there's these big silos that exist, not just, you know, between our hazards. And we often think, you know, geological tsunami and weather, but actually we're dealing with health as well here. And they're so interlinked, especially when we're talking about very, um, you know, uh, mega cities and compact urban environments. So where do you, how do you think we can actually help improve integrating warnings with both the public health side and um, on the weather side, because that's like a whole world of two very established um, institutions coming together, um, which is very, very challenging. Uh, that's a really interesting question, uh, which I periodically um, give some thought to. My, my observation, I mean, as, as you sort of implied, um, my observation is that we have two global level structures, both of which are really important. Arguably, the health one is probably the bigger and which have almost diametrically opposed views on how one should deal with, um, uh, with, with a, an impending disaster. And I don't think what we do will change that. I think what we can do, though, is to uh, create an evidence base which can be used to uh, build uh, analysis which ultimately will provide the basis for uh, either side to to uh, uh, to decide that you know think their approach needs needs to change in in whatever way I, I don't actually see the two coming together um, I, I think it's 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 just too big, 
And of course, both, both structures have evolved to best meet what they perceive to be the, the problems that they're addressing. So um, yeah, it's huge. And we saw that uh, particularly brought into relief during COVID um, because the, the approach, the warning approach, for instance, was just completely different from what you'd expect for a weather related um, thing. So, yeah. so, so to me, I think uh, the biggest challenge is still communication when we deal with all these uh, issues. Since uh, for me, coming from the background in physical uh, climate, uh, we are always improving our predictions, but how such predictions can be useful, how such values can be picked up in the appropriate occasions, the downstream chains, I would say, there are issues. And uh, for us, we need to build such synergy for the correct message to be delivered. Um, I'm going to give some examples at a more local level. So um, I was, as, as Karina said when she introduced me, I was involved in um, with a team that developed the world's first thunderstorm asthma warming, warning service. We had in Melbourne in 2016 uh, an incidence of a whole lot of people getting asthma all at once and swamping the hospitals and the ambulances and this health system couldn't cope. And it was thunderstorm asthma where um, pollen grains, allergenic pollen grains, were broken up and, and breathed in, and people had severe allergic reactions, and 10 people died. And the health department in the state of Victoria, where I live, had never seen anything like this before. And they sort of knew it existed, but um, they came to the Bureau of Meteorology and said, we can't let this happen again. We were swamped. We didn't know what to do. Let's put together a warning system jointly. And so we actually used a value chain approach. And this, this was um, Tom Butcher, actually, you know Tom, at the Met Office, was with Seconda to us. We started with what, it, what does the health department need? Okay, so this wasn't what does the community need. This was what does the health department need? Work back up the chain. And we did consider what does the community need as well. But really, the, the interesting thing about this, and we, we, we created a, a warning system that worked that the health department's perspective was, we don't want to be surprised. We don't want a high impact event like this. So we need advance warning of dangerous conditions. A weather service with a national mandate wants to protect every individual, whether they're out in Whoop Whoop or whether they're in downtown Melbourne. And so we've got different um, drivers for what we're trying to do. And this was a very interesting discussion about, well, what service do we provide? Do we focus on the cities where the impact will be high? Or do we offer a service to everybody? Because they could look quite different. Um, and we ended up deciding to do a service to everybody. But um, that experience of who is the decision maker, what do they need, um, was, was a really interesting one to go through. Um, Thank you, and I definitely have my own examples from the volcano world where it's really important to ask your users what they want and need, and that's really kind of the core process, and then that comes back to upstream engagement, so what you're talking about in terms of science communication is really important, and I think, you know, that's why the Warning Research Centre is part based in science and technology studies, because there's a lot of expertise and knowledge about how do we communicate science, and how that's done in different areas and, and disciplines um, and through other different challenges, such as what we've seen with genetically modified food or different health issues. And we can sort of apply those lessons in the context of, uh, of the warning and natural hazard world as well. So, yeah, that's all really interesting. Thank you for your answers. Now, does anyone else have some questions for the panel? Yes, oh, we've got some over here. Excellent. Thank you. Hi. Um, I... I really like the hills and valleys diagram as well. <laughs> um, and just come, you know, off a remark that Beth made, you know, that a supercomputer costs 100 million pounds. Um, thinking about 
you know, the, the value of these different steps in the chain. And it brought to mind the business case, for example, for the UK Met Office supercomputer, which was around that amount. Um, I wondered sort of, you know, if we think of it like this, how much money do we need to take out of that 100 million pounds off the supercomputer budget to put into other steps of the chain? Uh, or, or you know, is is if there is a finite budget for all of this for meteorological services, you know, how how would you redistribute it to to make best use of the information that's there? So I think, in a sense, that's already been answered. Um, in that, the hundred million is not just for the supercomputer. The hundred million includes how the information gets to people and to some extent the way it gets to people um, but particularly how it gets to people so there's a lot of there's quite a lot of spend out of that on uh, post-processing in order to get the information into a form that will uh, be of most most use to people the other thing that uh, it's easy to forget is that the hundred million is not uh, an increment, a large part of the 100 million is to maintain the current capability, which is already supposed to be providing, uh, what is it, a, a 15 to one, I think was the last estimate, um, benefit. So just keeping that that going is, I suppose, uh, I, I don't know, 60, 70% of, of it. Um, uh, but but you're right the the issue and and there is an increasing recognition of the need to get the right information to the right people um you'll be aware that we introduced a uh, uh, a heat heat wave warning service last year and that came out of talking to uh potential users customers alongside the the health people um, you're probably also aware um, that we now do a lot of communication through social media um, and things like TikTok. Um, you know, putting the weather forecast out on TikTok might seem a nonsense, but we know because we've done the surveys that there are a lot of people who will not receive the information unless it's on TikTok, and therefore you have to do it if you're going to get to those people and. If you're going to do it, you've got to do it properly. So you've got to do it so that it looks like real TikTok. <laughs> Anybody else want to chip in? No? I'm very curious as to what a TikTok video that's appropriate looks like. I'm going to have to join TikTok now. So here we go. Quite another question from the floor. Hey, uh, thank you very much. This is really interesting um, talks this afternoon. Um, and uh, so some of my research um, has focused on looking at the impact of spurious alerts or alerts that go out um, and um, maybe they go out to a, a large geographical area and only a very small area is actually um, Im impacted. Um, I just wondered if the panel could say a few things about them, and in particular about the impact they have on future alerts that go out go out afterwards, and particular if that can intersect with the the value chain approach, or if there's any way of sort of using the value chain approach to evaluating the impact those kind of spurious alerts have. I know that there is um, quite a lot of research into uh, false alarms, essentially a crying wolf, um, and whether people prefer to still get warned, even though that most of the time it doesn't happen. I'm not, I'm not an expert on that, but I do think the value chain approach could be quite useful in collecting examples of that. At the moment, we don't have in our database yet examples where there was a big warning, but the thing didn't really pan out the way that it was warned for. And so people might have felt, well, what was that all about? You know, um, So we, would, we should collect cases like that. And really to understand what was, the, what was the communication that happened, what was the response that happened. The, being able to collect that data um, is an a, a important part of the value chain. It's not the whole value chain, but um, 
I think that methodology is still um, we're, we're using survey methodologies and 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 other kinds of things um, to get primary data. If if we could, it's hard to do. It's expensive, but um, it's definitely along the value chain. No question. Yeah, I think it's a really interesting area. I'm aware of some research that suggests that near misses don't count as false alarms, provided the person, you know, that the, the person who received the warning is aware that the, the, the thing that was warned about happened, but perhaps didn't quite hit them. Um, so how near is near and, <laughs> and so on. Uh, the, the other thing that's interesting from that point of view is the, um, so we use this sort of um, uh, warning matrix of uh, probability versus impact. And the low probability, high impact warning is a particularly difficult one. Um, but as it stands, while it's low probability, people should understand that it means they probably won't get hit the challenge is, is not so much then the false alarm as persuading them that even though it's low probability, there are still some things they should be doing to stay safe. Um, and, and I suppose this sort of maps across, if, if you look over in the States, um, the tornado warning sort of thing, and how, what, how, big is, how big an area does a tornado warning cover? Um, how close does it have to be? And I'm aware of anecdotal evidence of, of people saying, well, um, we knew there was a tornado, but tornadoes never affect our side of the valley. So you know, we didn't take any, any notice and then it did sort of thing. So um, I, th I think it's, it, it, can, it can work both ways. And it, it's certainly an area that needs, needs more work. And I, I suspect there are ways of communicating that, make it uh, more likely or less likely that people will you know, ha be, will perceive a false alarm. Do you want to? I, I thought this question uh, is uh, relevant to me, but uh, when Brian mentioned the near misses, I, I, I think uh, I do have something to say about it. Uh, from my uh, perspective uh, as a climate modeler, like uh, we've been doing all kinds of uh, uh, ensemble modeling, and uh, when we do the so-called impact studies, we do play around our models to see what kind of impacts such changes could bring. So then when we talk about near misses, so they are essentially due to some false alarm, but uh, those signals were genuinely produced by our models, right? But uh, then why do our models produce such signals? We need to understand. And uh, it could be due to some um, over simplistic configurations we have in our model. It could be due to some background climate that uh, we didn't consider possible changes. But uh, such false alarms are still quite useful. If we bring all those factors into our prediction, even though they are false alarm, but uh, they might be true in the future. And what lessons can we really learn from such a false alarm would still be useful. Thank you. Thank you. So um, to me, it's pretty clear that the High Weather Project has done a lot of work and made a lot of progress in the last, in the last 10 years. It's also really clear there's a lot of progress still needed that's going to keep us busy for the next, I don't know, 20, 30 years. So, um, so yeah, so thank you very much. So I just wanted to... Um, just wrap up by saying thank you so much to, to our panellists, Ting, Brian and Beth, who's all the way over from Australia. Thank you so much for joining us today and for your presentation. We are really excited to see where the database is going to go and what research and analysis and how we can help enhance warnings going forward. Um, we'd also like to thank Amanda for our, our wonderful um, our administrator for organizing the event. Thank you and the filming crew to enable this online. So thank you very much. Um, we will have this online. So if you wanted to watch again or those online missed it, you can watch it again. Um, and our next event will be on the 31st of January. So that's less than a week away at 3 p.m. on Mexico seismicity and the seismic alert system by Dr. Carlos Miguel Valides Gonzalez. 
So please do join us for that event and details are on our website. So thank you very much, everybody. Thank you for joining us online. And uh, for those of you here, please do have some of the refreshments and uh, feel free to stay and have a chat. So thank you very much, everybody.